Um, a church board a number of years ago uh, decided that the people in their congregation were embarrassed when the offering plates were passed. And uh, so they thought, that they thought that they ought to have a new system that wouldn't embarrass anybody, uh, especially those who couldn't give. And so they asked a, a local carpenter to design a way of handling it so people could give as they came in and went out of the church. And, and so the carpenter built several interesting boxes that he put at each door. And, uh, and, uh, but these boxes were definitely different because if you dropped in a dollar or more, it made no noise. It was silent. But if you gave a half dollar, a little bell would go off. Ding! And if you gave a quarter, it blew a whistle, right? And then if you gave a dime, a siren went off. And then if you gave a nickel, a shot sounded. And then if you gave nothing at all, it took your picture. I don't know if the board members got what they were hoping to get at that particular time. But I bring that up because our topic today is tithing, what it is, why it is, and who's it for. And this is the first message of a series that we're going to be doing on spiritual disciplines. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about things like fasting and prayer and meditation and scripture reading and more. But today we're going to talk about what the Bible calls a tithe. So what's a tithe? A tithe means a tenth. The dictionary defines tithe as the tenth part of agriculture cultural produce or personal income set apart as an offering to God or for works of mercy or the same amount regarded as an obligation or tax for the support of the church, priesthood, or the like. Now, uh, an obvious question, you probably already know the answer to this, but is tithing found in the Bible? Or I should say, is it found only in the Bible? And actually it's not. A giving of a portion of one's profits or the spoils of war was known in the ancient world from Greece to China. It's not just a Bible thing. Gifts, gifts were made as, as religious offerings or they were given to political authorities as a tribute or a tax. And many times the religious and the political gifts were combined since it was very common to associate earthly and divine authority as one, right? Remember the kings always thought that they were gods. You know, the, the, the ancient pharaohs believed that they were gods. And so when money was given to the political group, it was given to God in their mind. And, and here's something interesting I found out. The donation of a tenth portion or tithe was common apparently because most people counted in tens based on their fingers, right? So if you lost your finger, I don't know how that works, T. You'd have to tell me, right? So when did tithing first start? Well, in the very first book of the Bible, Abram, before he was renamed Abraham, Abram gave one-tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek, and he was the priest king of Salem. Genesis 14, 18, 20, here's what it says. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He, Melchizedek, blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him a tenth of all. So that's when tithing first showed up in the Bible. Later on in that same book of Genesis, tithing appeared as a tribute to God when Jacob gave a tenth of his possessions to God if he returned home safely. Genesis 28, 22 tells us this. We'll start in verse 20. Then Jacob said, made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house and all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So Abram did it, then Jacob did it as a tribute to God, and in the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, uh, we are instructed to give a tenth of the first fruits that we have. The first fruits, of, this was an agricultural society, the first of their produce, the first of their fruit was to be given as a tribute to God. Exodus 34, 26, you shall bring the very first of the fruit uh, let me try that again. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. 
So there it is in Exodus. In the third book of the Bible, Numbers, Numbers chapter 18, 20, 21, after spending about 40 years wandering in the desert, the nation of Israel was about to enter into the promised land. They were about to enter into Canaan, and it was to be divided up. The land was to be divided between the 12 tribes of Israel. However, there was one tribe, the Levites. They were chosen by God to take care of the tabernacle and all of its many of the parts. They were the ones that were to take care of all the sacrifices that were to be done to God, and because because of that, they were awarded a tithe because they would not receive land in Canaan as the rest of the 12 tribes would. And then they also tithed on what they were given. Now here's how it says it in Numbers 18.20. Then the Lord said to Aaron, he was the, he was the chief priest at that time, then the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land nor, nor own any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. Verse 21, to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service, which they perform, the service of the tent of meeting. Now, did everyone have to tithe? Well, uh, yes and no. So, so when God had Moses record the giving of a tithe as part of keeping God's law, and then that law was passed down to the nation of Israel, well, to remain obedient to God, tithing was one of the laws, just one of the laws God said to follow and obey, right? However, again, it's an agricultural society. And if a person didn't want to actually give away or give as a tithe what he produced, he could redeem it. In other words, he could buy it back, if you will. And he could redeem it for 120% of its value, except when it came to livestock. Now, look at this, Leviticus 27, 31, right? It says, therefore, a man wishes to, if a man wishes to redeem, redeem a part of his tithe, he shall add one-fifth of it. In other words, he's going to give back more than it would be worth. And then look at verse 27, I'm sorry, look at verse 32. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. Do you see that line about passing under the rod? Just to kind of give you a picture of biblical times. Once a year, that was talking about livestock. Once a year, you would take all of your livestock, your bulls, your rams, your goats, your sheep, your ducks, your geese, your whatever you had, and, and they would have to pass single file under a rod that was dipped with some type of coloring. And then every tenth animal was marked. It was marked as it passed single file. And when it passed single file, uh, uh, that animal was considered your tithe. And, and you couldn't be, you couldn't take, keep the good ones for yourselves and put out the weak livestock or anything like that. You had to take everything that you had and whatever tenth animal it was, whether it was the prize bull or the prize goat or the lame, or, it would be considered a tithe and given to God as a tribute. Now, what was done with the tithe? What did they do with it? A uh, number of things. Now, we already mentioned that uh, the Levites were supported by the tithe, right? The, those were the priests who attended the tabernacle. We got that. But then the book of Deuteronomy instructed households to bring their tithes to the sanctuary for a joyous sacrificial meal. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 14.22. You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat it in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear, to fear the Lord your God always. Now, there's another thing that they did with the tithe that's kind of neat. Uh, every third year, the tithe remained in the hometown. So now think about this. That at once a year, they would go to wherever the tabernacle was, and they would bring all their tithe to that, whether that was a journey of three blocks or, or 30 miles or 50 miles, whatever. Once a year, they would travel like that and go to God and, and take their tithe. But once every third year, they were to keep the tithe right there in their hometown. And that tithe, that tithe was to be given to the, let me find my place again, that tithe was to be given given to the alien and the orphan and the widow. Uh, verse 
Deuteronomy 14.28, it says, At the end of every third year you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year, and you shall deposit it in your town. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied, and either that the Lord, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Now, you see that scripture up there? Looking at that scripture, let me point something out to you about today. Long before, long, long before the welfare system was put into place in America, that same welfare system that we recognize at times is broken and gets abused, long before that, God had established a plan to take, to take care of the widows and the orphans. They were to be cared for through the obedience of God's people in their giving. See that? That's what happened long before there was welfare. Why do we have welfare today? Well, uh, you know, I was surprised to hear that the political analyst Ann Coulter once said this. She said, if every Christian and Jew tithe their income as the Bible commands, every poor person would be cared for, every naked person clothed, and every hungry person fed. That's God's welfare system. That's how he planned on taking care of those that were without. Now, uh, that's how the Bible uses the tithe. That's, how, that's where it came from. That's how it's used. But, and, and that's some of the things that are done with tithe. But what purpose does tithing have for us personally? What's it going to do for you and me? Here's a couple of things. For us and the men and the women we read about in the Bible, tithing indicates our devotion to God. Okay? Tithing indicates our understanding that everything we have ultimately comes from God. Tithing reflects our appreciation of him and towards him. Tithing reflects our understanding of our reliance on God. How about this? Tithing reflects our understanding that God is more valuable than our possessions. And lastly, tithing, it's understood when we tithe that it's an act of obedience that we will account for. Now, no one likes that last purpose of tithing, but we, we have to mention it because it's going to happen. Romans 14, 12 says, every one of us then will have to give an account to God. We'll give an account for our giving. We'll give an account for our stinginess. We'll give an account for our words. We'll give an account for our actions. We'll give an account for our inactions. We're going to give an account for everything, and this is just one of those things. You know, it's really interesting that when, when Jesus regarded stewardship of our finances, which is what tithing is a part of, when Jesus regarded stewardship of our finances, he, he looked at the person that was tithing as an indication of their trustworthiness at holding spiritual things, because the spiritual things were more important than the earthly things, right? In fact, when Jesus talked about tithing in the New Testament, he was never focused on the amount. He was, never focused, uh, he was never focused on the amount of what was being given. He was focused on the inward attitudes. You know, it's really interesting because the New Testament instructs us to pay our taxes. But nowhere in the New Testament does it require Christians to tithe in the sense of giving 10%. But it does reiterate many things associated with tithing, things that we've already mentioned. 1 Corinthians 9.14 says, Those who minister are entitled to receive report, uh, support. 1 Corinthians 16.1, Galatians 2.10, they say the poor and the needy should be cared for from our tithing. And then 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 through 10 says this, that those who give can trust God as the source of all that is given. Now, that's the one I want to focus on because we haven't really talked about that. You see, even though the New Testament doesn't say give one-tenth, these verses that we're about to look at give us a good guideline to follow when it comes to paying tithes. So let's take a look, uh, closer look at these, and, and I'm going to explain each one as they go. Here we go. 2 Corinthians 9, 9, 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know what that's saying in verse 6? It says, look, you can give liberally or you can give stingily. However, how we give 
will determine what will be harvested in our lives. The way as a man sows, so shall he reap, right? And then we have 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, there was one church bulletin that read that God loves a cheerful giver, but will accept money from a grouch as well. But this verse actually tells us something different, doesn't it? What this is telling us in verse 7 is when it comes to God tithing, give because you want to. Give because you want to. Give because you have studied what the Bible said, you've reasoned in your heart, and you have concluded for yourself that a tithe given to God is the right thing to do. If you're not tithing for that reason, you shouldn't be tithing. God says that we should be happy about it. And if you're not happy about giving to God, then keep your money. Because here's the truth. God never did need your money. God never will want your money. He wants your heart. And if he can't have your heart, all the money in the world means nothing to the man that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So what's it say? Give because you want to, because you know it's the right thing to do. And be thankful for that. Now, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and verse 8 and 9, they're a little bit tougher to uh, understand. And so we're going to read them. And they, they kind of throw me off when I read them. See how you handle them. It says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, you look at that first verse there, that verse 8, that's tough. What in the world is all of that saying? What does that mean? And, and, and this is what it says, okay? It says this, if you give, God will make sure you have enough for yourself and others. That's what it's saying. Now, that same verse in the Good News Bible says this. It says, God's able to give you more than you need so that you always have what you need for yourselves and more than enough to give to every good cause. See, if you give, God says, I'm going to make sure that if you give, I'm going to make sure that there's enough for you for every good cause. One more reason to sign up for hoagies, right, Lynn? 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and verse 11 says this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving for God. Again, if you take the time to study it, you'll be able to figure it out. Let me just cut to the chase and give us the Cliff Notes version. This is what verses 10 and 11 are saying. It says, God will take our tithes and offerings, and he will multiply his goodness in our lives beyond our finances. Beyond our finances. The Bible says that he will give to us liberally, and that means that we will be enriched in everything. Because you see, when we give to God, our entire lives become potential fields for his blessing in our lives. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples of that in just a minute. But first, let me tell you what tithing has done for me. Tithing has allowed me to see and to recognize the good hand of God in my life, distributing grace, favor, protection, and provision in my life. And, and let me see if this next illustration helps to explain what tithing's done for me. There was, a, there was an old rich man, and he was cranky, and he was, had a miserable attitude, and he went to see a rabbi who lived a pretty simple life. And, and they weren't together long before the rabbi got a wonderful idea to illustrate to this cranky man just, just why his cranky attitude and miserly ways were so wrong. And he led the man over to a window, and he said, what do you see out the window? The old man replied, I, I see some men and some women and some children. Rabbi said, fine. Then he led him over to a mirror, and he said, tell me what you see in the mirror. The man kind of frowned, and he said, well, obviously I see myself. 
the rabbi said, interesting. The window is made out of glass. The mirror is made out of glass. But as soon as there was a little bit of silver put on it, you could only see yourself. Well, this is what I found out about myself. When I don't tithe, I focus on what I need to do for me, and then every penny counts. There's never enough to go around for anything, and, and generosity beyond the, con the confines of my own household are severely restricted. Or, if I should put it in other words, I'm not giving to you or anyone else because I need it for myself. That's what happens when I don't tithe, and I've been in that position many times. But when I do tithe, the worries for the provision of my household shift from my shoulders to God's. It's amazing. They shift from my shoulder to God's shoulders. Tithing causes me to trust him instead of myself. And somehow, God meets my needs, and, and he provides enough that we can help others as well. And, and it's not just in dollars and cents. Remember I said that when you tithe, all the fields of your life have the potential of blessing, right? Well, it's not just dollars and cents. God provides in our life by, by not only giving us things, but also holding back things that I think that I need. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, last year, I was bidding a job. And it was, a, it was a nice job, you know, a fancy job, all this kind of stuff, and lots of money. And, 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 and so I, I bid this job for literally six months I spent bidding this job. Every time I'd come up with a number, the architect or the owner would change, and we'd go back and forth, on and on and on. And, and finally, I got to the point that I just said, that's it. I, I've, I've wasted all the time I can waste on this. I've walked away. You've been there, right? I've, I've spent all the time I can spend on this, and I walked away. That's it. I, and I was, I was discouraged. If you ask Becky, I was, I was mad. I was discouraged. I'd worked so long. I thought we were going to get that job. It was going to be a prestige job, and on and on and on. And, and, but it didn't happen. Well, that particular job that I didn't get was literally half a block away from a job that I did get. And, and so I'm working on this one job, and, and, uh, and I see they come to the job I didn't get, and they start to do their excavating, and they put in their foundation and things like that, and ever, all of a sudden the whole job just stops, just stops. And I thought, okay, well, maybe it's the weather, maybe it's this way, and it stopped, and it stayed stopped, and it stayed stopped, and it stayed stopped. Finally, I come to find out that the neighbor behind the people who had started the job that I didn't get, the neighbor behind them, once they started the job, that neighbor took them to court and was suing them because their new addition was blocking her view of the street. And it's like I heard God say, see, I know what I'm doing. Because here's what happens. If you ever get on a job like that, that money comes and you spend it and it goes here and it goes there. And, you know, that job would have really hurt our business. And yet God spared us in that way. You know what I consider that? I consider that the favor of God. That's what I consider. It didn't come back in, in exact cash or anything like that, but God spared me. Another time there was a truck, and I know I've shared this with you, another time there was a truck that I wanted in Mount Pleasant. Oh, I wanted this truck. It was a crew cab diesel, was everything that we wanted. We went out and looked at it. I talked to the guy. Everything was fine. We agreed on the number. My wife and I, I think, went out that night to pick it up like two days later, and everything had changed. Now it was a different price, and it was this, and it was that, and we couldn't negotiate back to that original number, and finally I said, that's it. That's it. I, I forget it. I don't want it. And I, uh, we started to go home. And I remember we were driving right through the heart of Mount Pleasant, heading towards 119, if you know where I'm at. I know you guys do. And, and, and I'm really disgusted about what has happened. And I really wanted this truck. And, and I'm driving down, and there's a church sign that says, be thankful for what you didn't get. You know what that is? That's the favor of God. You can't put a dollar amount on something like that. That's what tithing has done for me. It takes off my worry and it puts it on God's shoulder. And God says, I will take care of you. God says, I have more than enough. 
The Bible says that he is our sufficiency. He's everything that you need. Everything that you need. That's the God we serve. And we show God our understanding of that by tithing. We, we really do. Now, uh, you know, Gordon H. Hinckley said this. He says, I have yet to find a faithful tithe payer who cannot testify that in, a, in a very literal and wonderful way the windows of heaven having been opened and blessings having been poured out upon him or her. That's what he said. There's one last quote I want to close with today. St. Augustine said this. He said, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospel you believe, it's yourself. How about that? You know, tithing, tithing is a big step in the life of a person who is seeking to live God's way because it challenges us to trust God in our day-to-day -day circumstances. It, it literally stretches us to trust Him and it forces us to take our eyes off of the false idols of what the world defines as riches and security and to see that it is God and God only who meets the needs that we have. It's only God. So if you're not tithing and, and you want to grow spiritually, I challenge you, take, take a good hard look at this. Grab your Bible, study it for yourself. See what God says, and then choose who's going to have your allegiance. Make that decision for yourself. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the examples in the Bible of how God provides for and takes care of his children. You're not, you're not going to want to miss the message next week. Anybody have any questions for me today about tithing? How bad was it? Was it painful? Good. As a minister, you always hate to talk about tithing, and yet there is so much blessing that God gives us through it. Right?